So without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Gerstel. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for that very kind introduction. I uh, just want to thank the Center for the invitation. It's uh, very nice for me. I grew up in the U.S., but um, I went to mostly universities here. But uh, my first real job was in the Australian National University, where I was 12 years, and I've been in London almost 20 years. So I haven't actually been in the States that much, uh, except for occasionally to visit family. So it's nice to be in the, in the intellectual context in the States. Um, the uh, Shunga project that was mentioned is what I've been involved in now for the past three years. This is a it is a very collaborative project with uh, SOAS at the University of London, the British Museum, Tim Clark in particular, and then two, two uh, institutes in Japan, the Nichibunken, the International Research Center for Japanese Studies, and Ritsumeikan University, um, which I have already had sort of connections with, but it turns out those are the two places where there's actually Shunga research going on as well. And so um, the, we've had various projects uh, in terms of um, surveys, workshops, uh, and uh, this will culminate in a, an exhibition at the British Museum. So we're planning a similar sort of volume to the Kabuki Heroes one, uh, and that will be in October 2013. And then um, it's quite exciting that we will also, it looks like it's going to be able to go to Tokyo and have an exhibition in Tokyo. And this will be the first time I think there have been shunga shown in exhibitions, but as far as I know, there's never been a shunga uh, exhibition itself, especially anything large scale in Japan. And so this will be quite a, hopefully, a good taboo breaking sort of exhibition, which will be from April uh, 2014. It's still a little ways off, but not that far. If, after my talk, if anyone wants to talk a bit more about that, I can uh, follow that up. Um, the one of the things that I have done recently on Shunga, two things actually. One is a little, a little volume. Uh, I'll leave, leave one of these uh, uh, book in Japanese for the library. Uh, and this is a little um, small book that was part of a festive for Howard Hibbert, uh, which has some translations of uh, some work, not particularly the work talked about today, but um, which is where I sort of entered into the Shunga world. This is a book about um, uh, parodies of women's educational books, erotic parodies of women's educational books, and uh, medium modestly, but I think the this book <laughs> sort of changes the view of Edo history, especially the history of of uh, women's sexuality, which is the general view is a very severe idea that women at home were to be mothers, and then any kind of sexual activity was, was the pleasure quarters, which is a very different view when you look at these uh, these books that we know now circulated very widely and probably were aimed as much or more at women. But what I want to talk about today is about one particular book that's uh, somewhat different, but around the same time period. The books that, that I uh, have been working on are in the 1750s and 60s. This one in particular, the um, Shin... Uh, Oops. That's the one before. Oops. Okay. Yes, the this is the, the title of the talk, the uh the, focused on this book, Makura Doji, Nyukisashi, Manben, Tamaguki, very long titles. And we do know most uh, Shunga books don't have a a uh, a date in them exact because they were uh, outside the censor system and they didn't put usually information about the publisher, the artist or the authors, but this book in particular, we, I'm almost positive, I think, that it's by Takehara Shuncho-sai, who's well known uh, as particularly Meishou's, the, the books on Meishou Zue, the uh, Miyako Meishou Zue, the books on uh, famous places in Japan. Um, it's, uh, we know that it's, I've been able to pin down, it's a parody particularly of one anthology textbook, in other words, a book that's aimed perhaps more at boys than at girls in this case, but a, an anthology, a great big anthology of different um, primers that were used for children's education. More than 2,000 titles of illustrated Shunga books survive today. 
which is a huge number, many with extensive text as well as explicit illustrations. My focus here is on works produced in Kyoto or Osaka in the second half of the 18th century. Many of these are parodies of educational books. A key question is how do we read these parodies that make jest of serious and didactic textbooks that were the mainstream of children's and young people's education. I have previously made an argument that the erotic parodies of the Osaka artist Tsukiyo Kosette created a counter discourse to Confucian-based popular ethical texts. Um, I've been trying to argue that we need to see many of the popular literature, including Shunga books, as somewhat directly as a counter discourse to the educational books that were being produced both for men and women in the late, from the late 17th century. These were the counter to the popular ethical texts which either ignore sex or portray sexual pleasure as evil, especially for women. Sette in the 1750s and 60s, immediately after the death of Shogun Yoshimune, was working in an environment when books on strict Confucian ethics flourished and when Shunga books and Ukiyo-zoshi, popular fiction had been in relative decline since the 17th century, since the 1720s after the Kyoho censorship edicts. The books in particular that he was working on, that uh, the Onna Dairaku Takarabeki is a parody of the most famous of the women's textbooks, Onna Dairaku Takarabako. Onna Taking Gesho Bunko is Another parody of a women's textbook, Onna Teiki Gosho Bunko, and Onna Shimegawa Oeshibumi is another parody of a well-known uh, women's textbook, Onna Imagawa Oeshibumi. So these are all direct parodies of core women's textbooks that were being produced. My argument has been that although Sette's works depict sex explicitly and often humorously, they are relatively wholesome in focusing on the importance of sexual pleasure for the physical and mental health of both men and women, and to foster and maintain conjugal relations. These books appear at the same time as early Sharibon in Edo, or some Sharibon were in Kyoto and Osaka as well, but mostly in Edo, but the focus is not on the pleasure quarters at all, and, relationship and readership is directed at women, I've argued, as much as at men. This is something I think that generally people haven't said at all, especially my colleague at Soaz, Time and Screech, who's presented Shunga as being basically for men only and for masturbation purposes, but I think he's way off on that one. That Shunga's a much broader, broader, broader subject than that. I also believe that the exclusion of these books from research on the Edo period presents a distorted picture of the past. This is one of the things I've really come to feel very strongly, that the suppression of these things, not so much in the Edo period, even though there was, it was below the censorship realm, but in the late Meiji and in the Taisho and Showa periods when um, police forces were empowered to be able to suppress actual possession of materials as, as opposed to production, meant that the taboo that was created meant that in the post-war especially, no one could research Shunga. People, a lot of people knew about it, but they didn't, I'm, many scholars have told me that they were told by their teachers not to publish, even if they had studied the things until very recently. And even today, the taboo is still very strong, as I'll explain a little bit afterwards, maybe when talking about the Shunga project. This paper examines a work published in Kyoto and Os or Osaka, we're not sure exactly, in 1776, only a few years after, later than set days, which is very different and might be described by many today as outrageously obscene. What do we make of this text that literally tramples all over the popular, serious children's anthology textbook, or Orai Mono, as it's called, Shin, Shin Doji Orai Bansei, this, this particular work. Um, which was published in Osaka in 1760 and then reprinted in 1775, just the year before this one. How do we read this parody that seems to revel in transforming Japan's famous historical figures into sexually avarice uh, women and men? Is this a polemical text in a political or social sense, or is it just pornographic text taking the piss out of the Japanese cultural, Japanese cultural heritage, bringing everyone from the highest classes downwards to grovel in the world of bestial desires. 
Are such works significant in influencing social attitudes and ethics? Do such works warrant serious analysis? The Shunga book title is Makura Doji Nuki Sashi Banben Tamaguki, which means something like Pillow Book for the Young, All You Need to Know About How the Jeweled Rod Goes In and Out. The title clearly toys with the educational book, an anthology of various previously published textbooks for young people, particularly boys, since many of the tales relate to history and the text is often in a kind of kambun. I will analyze what I call Makura Doji, asking questions about its nature as parody and about how the, this work fits into a kamigata, Kyoto Osaka tradition of using the Shunga book format as a form for subversive content. Because of the taboo on the study of Shunga, however, academic scholarship in Japan or elsewhere has not included this book, like others that have explicit sexual content, as part of the canon of Edo period literature. It has occasionally been mentioned, but almost entirely ignored, it is not found in Ukiyo Zoshi or Sharibon collections. Humor, parody, and satire, however, are not the sole prerogative, of course, of Shunga. Popular poetry, kyoka, sendu, fiction, and theater are all full of humorous and sometimes biting commentary on society and politics. But Shunga, being fundamentally an underground genre because of censorship, and one in which the power of explicitly sexual images predominate, came, I believe, to have a sense of itself as a distinctive genre or discourse after the Kyoho reforms and its censorship edicts. This thrusting of Shunga into the world of underground publishing, ironically, allowed, at least in theory, much more freedom to authors, artists, and publishers because of their anonymity. Let us first examine the content structure of this particular work to see what I'm describing as outrageous. It's a big, fascinating book, and I would like to make a case that's important, but also in the, in the style of Sete, but also innovative in other ways. It, ha it is, however, outrageous. It would take a long time to describe the whole book, but let me just outline what it contains. It's over 100 pages, 100 folds, and so it's a, in, in Edo period terms, it's a huge book, old horn styles. It's the largest format size book, uh, so it's very large. The preface says, this warai ezoshi, which is another word for a shunga book, or shunpon, in contrast to previous playful works that lack depth in fun and pleasure, is full of innovation to its deepest core. It will delight everyone from the young, inexperienced in sex with yet an immature penis to the old widow who uses warm plasters to stretch her wrinkles. We have collected a variety of well-known tales about sex and written them down word for word. These will be useful for training the art of sex and a diversion in between lovemaking that will stimulate you to have another session. The intention is clear. This book is to be entertaining and aims to stimulate interest in sex. The preface also claims the book to be an anthology of Shunga tales and lore rather than a work of complete originality. The preface places the book in the ongoing Shunga discourse. The subtitles that, si that lie on each side of the title suggest the book is for pleasure both sitting alone and for couples. This is the sort of, it should be turned around if it was uh, 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 you know, vertical title, of course. Um, but the, the K bowl reading of uh, these two things together, of course, is the bedroom. And Jiu here, I think, means something like as you like it, so solitary pleasures as well as mating kingfishers, the idea of the image, the, em the metaphor for, for couples and conjugal couples. This straightforwardly humorous intention sets the book within the ukiyo zoshi or sharibon genre, and the preface signals that this book will be more fun and racy than works of Sette, which precede it. Sette, perhaps wary of government censorship, he had seen what happened to, he knew what happened to, uh, to um, Nishikawa Skenobu during the censorship of, the, of 1722 when his books were banned, um, that he never refers directly to, hum to historical figures. <coughs> the original book that this parodies was a popular primer text, most likely well known to the contemporary audience. I think even the Takehura, Takehara Shuncho Sai was actually involved in the production of that book. I think I, I won't argue here, but I, you can argue from the, the, the images in it that he was involved in the original as well. 
It starts off, the original book starts off with um, Shotoku Taishi lecturing uh, courtiers. And the parody has Jotoku Taishi, the passionate Shotoku Taishi. He's in a field with a girl, and the text says that he's pinching her bottom. He, here's the images. Unfortunately, the, I, ca I haven't been able to find a good copy. These textbooks in the Edo period were used so much, very few good copies survive. <laughs> But the left is Shotoku Taishi uh, lecturing the courtiers, and on the right is him in the field. The text has actually been, been done in light colors, so it's almost faded, but I have found enough text to, to determine it's the, he's, he's pinching her bottom in the... So this is a, d a direct parody so far. And then the next section has the seven gods of good fortune, and then the, in the original, and the parody has seven amorous types fornicating. So you have Daitokuten, all the, the figures. So here's the first one, the original, the seven gods of good fortune. Then you have the seven sexy, the seven people of the world, the sex. So the widow, who's always, always presented as being uh, sexually avarice because she's, she's wanting it. The wakashu, which means the young boy who's liked both by men and women. The monk, who's, of course, always after young boys, but also women. The mistress, whose, of course, job is to be sexually interesting. The retired man, who has nothing else else to do to, to explore these things. The actor, who's the focus of both men and women as well, in terms of prostitution, and, and then finally the courtesan. So in fact, in the picture, the courtesan and the actor are the ones that are together. But you can see the, the, je the very clear parallels. They've, they're parodying both text and images. The next one you have a situation that's showing where illustration examples of children learning situations, a series of, of pictures of different kinds of learning aspects, uh, learning uh, uh, all kinds of different skills as well as educational learning. And then you have the same thing, learning different kinds of aspects of sex, a direct parody. It, just to give one example, this is a close-up of one where the, the book, you can't read it here really, but the book is Onna Dairaku Takarabeki, the parody of the Onna Daigaku book I mentioned before, which is aimed at women. You can, if, if you see the original, you can actually tell that, that's the, that this is where you learn about sex. And so you, you have a, a man and a woman here. Of course, the boys here is learning, or the teaching or learning. It's a bit of an older character. One of the fascinating things in the dialogue in this one, the, the, di the, the text says, that you know, this book the, here, this book teaches you all about various aspects, how to approach a woman, all kinds of things like that, and how a woman should respond. And then it says, uh, the, the the text then, the woman says, "Hayo say na," and then the guy says, "Inochi torime." The woman saying, "Hurry up, get on with it." You know, you all want all this talk. Let's actually get get on with it. And he says, "You'll be the death of me." Yet, so this this image that often happens in these is a, of a woman actually being sexually interested, being proactive rather than being submissive is one of the common themes in, in most of these works. Then we have, a, the original has a section Tenjinkyo, which is the wisdom of Sugawara Michizane, or the most, you know, why, the, you know, the figure even today, the Tenjin Matsuri, the Tenjin uh, deity, the figure of learning. And then you have the, that's switched over to Tenjin also, of course, is another word for a high-level courtesan. So you have Tenshoku, so the original you have the situa here's the original where you have a, situa uh, a picture of a terakoya with Sugawara Michizane's image in the alcove on, this, on the um, here. And the, actually, it's women there with the, the children learning, preparing for their lessons, different things, doing ikebana as well, looks like. And then the image in the parody has all the children learning, looking at sex books, learning. And this, the little child says, oh, that looks like it tickles. This is all uh, made in jest. And here you have Izanagi and Izanami, the founders of, you know, the course of the Japanese islands, the sexual uh, the beginnings image. But again, you can see how directly the parody is, uh, is in between the two of them. The next one, then, is in the original book. It has the... Um, Talks about the famous, most famous calligraphers in, in Japanese history, um, Sagaten no Kobo Daishi, Tachibana no Hayanari. But then it switches to, with a pun, 
This character, which also means a woman's privates, is, can be pronounced hitsu, so it's making a pun. You have uh, honcho san bitsu, hazan hitsu, honcho san hitsu. And so it's the three great pussies of the realm, and they are, these are quite important people that are being parodied here, being burlesqued here. You have Empress Komyo, who's probably one of the most, in all, any kind of retsujo den or you know, histories of Japanese women, she is always the first one because she was known for creating hospitals, for helping the poor in the Nara period, and so is an example of, of, a, of a very perfect woman. And here is, she's also the mother of Koken, the emperor, and here it's, uh, she's presented as a sexually avarice uh, uh, woman. So in modern Japan, especially after the Meiji period, to, to print, pre present the empress uh, like this was, would be absolutely outrageous. And most Japanese are actually surprised because most people don't know about these kind of books. Then you have even more wild one of, of um, Empress Emperor, who was actually an emperor herself, Koken, who's put as the grandest pussy in all Japan, with Yugi no Dokyo, which is the famous story, the, f the fellow who actually tried to usurp the throne through her. Um, I'll leave the dialogue to you to read on the screen, but the, uh, he, there's a tradition, it seems, of Dokyo having been selected because of having a huge penis. There's, it goes back quite far, and at Ritsumeikon, there's an interesting scroll, which it's, the scroll itself is not so old. It was, it's written, it says 1821, but the f it says that it's a copy of, of, uh, uh, of a scroll that goes back to Toba Sojo with the medieval period. You know, these things are, uh, we don't know for sure about these things, but the story certainly goes back where you had a competition in the land to find a suitable man to serve the empress. And uh, eventually, Dokyo is the one chosen. And then they have their session. She is, her face is kindly uh, hidden there. Um, and then afterwards, she's sort of being attended to, and you have a very contented, exhausted Dokyo after the, after the event. Finally, the third one is Tokiwa Gozen with Kiyomori. And the other one is that she's, the story is that she, uh, her cries during sex are too loud, and, and even Kiyomori says, you're way too loud, you're way too loud. So as you can see from this, this stuff's pretty wild in the sense of taking this is, you're looking at the original anthology, which is setting up Japan's most revered historical figures, Shotoku Taishi, Kuka, well, I haven't got to Kuka yet, but Kuka is coming, um, and uh, making all of them, I guess burlesque is one of the words we could use for burlesque is bringing things down to uh, uh, that sort of level, is taking all of these characters down. What does that mean? What is it, what's going on here? Uh, is it just making fun of something, but it's quite serious in a sense because it's so systematic. And then you have another section of the, the three more famous calligraphers, and then the three great lovers. And you've got Kibi no Makibi, Ku, Kobo Daishi, and Ariwara no Narihira, of course, is famous uh, throughout his general because Tales of Isayan as a lover, but not so much Kukai. But Kukai, just to give you one example, they says he goes off to Japan, uh, to China, of course, but he comes back Basically, his most important teaching he brings back is the way of nanshoku, the way of male-male love. So you have the most revered religious figure. <laughs> you have the most revered female empress figure. You have all of the most revealed intellectual figure, both I mean, in Suga and Michizane, and, other, and um, all made fun of. Finally, you have Yoshitsune and Benkei. And Yoshitsune, the original, has a very serious letter to his brother, but in the other one, it's just about their rampages through the pleasure quarters. Yoshitsune and Benke, their wild, their wild sort of life. So all of the most famous figures, the children's models, are presented on. So in other words, the adults reading these things would have read <laughs> these books earlier in their life, the serious books, the teaching books, early in their life, and therefore are revel reveling in this kind of book. Further, the book has full page like this, uh, images of couples making love, and then a fairly extensive dialogue on top for the 12 months. This one is, you see, it's Kyoksui, 
about Kyokusui, and everyone in uh, Esperanza would know most about Kyokusui, the, the whole image of, of elegant courtiers along a stream drinking but also composing poetry. Uh, and this changes it around, and it's really quite clever. And it says, Kyokusui has the hidden meaning of Kyokutori no Sui. Kyokutori means having sex in the Edo period. And Sui, of course, means doing things elegantly. So to have sex in style. So this is taking the, making a pun out of the original Japanese of Kyokusui, the, particularly the courtiers. Today I'll do lots to make sure you enjoy yourself, the prince is saying to the princess. Since we've already had a few drinks, your little fellow seems bigger than usual, and I'm feeling randy. Look over there upstream. It looks like Tsukioka Chujo making it with a youth. Watching others having fun makes me even more excited. Hurry up, let's get started. Well then, shall we begin the prince's lovemaking? This, is, this hime hajime is always used as sort of the first sex of the year or the first sex for a, a young girl. This is when the great log flows into the narrow valley. Here comes the log. You're sort of making fun of sort of the elegant language you in this. And the girl says, of course, who goes through all that ritual? All right, get on with it, get on with it. This whole idea of how ridiculous these kind of formal aspects are. Now, um, well, then it goes on to the, there's 12 short stories with one sex, sort of explicit image in each one of them, which are these are more extended short stories, again, with the idea that they've been stories that have been told over the centuries, uh, at least in the, in the, from the 18th century. Now, uh, I think this book, and a few others have, but it's been attributed to various people, Takehara Shuncho Sai, who's an Osaka artist famous for books on landscape, particularly Miyako Meisho Zue and other Meisho. This was the, these are some of the most popular books in the Edo period, and very elegantly done. But he also illustrated Ukiyo Zoshi, Orai Mono, the, um, <coughs> these textbooks, poetry collections, uh, and I think he actually did part of this, uh, and the original anthology that's been, these are some of the books that he's doing in the same period. You can see Makura Doji right in the middle of that. Uh, these are, uh, that's uh, uh, Ukyo Zoshi, uh, Ukyo Zoshi. This is a didactic book, a textbook. Uh, this is also a dance guide. And then this book comes in there, uh, Kyoka book. And then Nanuma, that's one of his first uh, guidebooks. And then Miyako Meiso Juyo. So right. One of the key aspects of shunga is that we now know that almost all famous artists also did shunga, even kanoha figures. Um, and probably some of the best collections of shunga paintings are in old daimyo family holdings, still even today, and probably in the imperial household as well. Probably the best collection of, of, of shunga paintings is probably in the imperial household, although that would be it, the existence is, is completely denied today because they would have received stuff for uh, births, uh, I mean, for marriages, for all kinds of um, uh, auspicious times, because obviously whenever you're in a, in a context, a daimyo or, a, uh, or the tenno household, where you must have an heir, these kind of things are absolutely essential. But there's also a sense that these scrolls had protective powers and protected against fire, as well as, protect, as, as, um, as um, uh, um, obviously for fertility, and these things as well. The book world is something different. This is, of course, popular world rather than there's painting world, which was never censored as such. Only th the only thing we had censorship for in the Edo period was for publications. And we also don't seem to have censorship for circulation. And we now know that the most, that, that Kashihonya, the itinerant booksellers, virtually always had shunbon, shunbon with them when they circulated. Uh, and that this, we don't know of any record of them ever being prosecuted for a circulation at least until well into the, into the Meiji period. I don't, we don't know who the author is, but I think it's probably one of these two characters, Masuya Taidyo or Nakarai Kinryo, who were active in Ukiyo Zoshi about the same time and did some books with Takehara Shuncho Sai. And one of them is very much interested in theater, and the other is, is kind of a wild character. And he also signs his name Jiraku, which is one of the uh, names that's in the book. It's clear that the underground status of Shumpon offered writers and artists carte blanche to push parody, satire, and burlesque to the extremes. The year of publication in 1776, the American Revolution year, <laughs> corresponds with the heyday of the Tanama era of relative political and cultural freedom, and almost exactly with the era of Sharibon Dangibon 
and what is considered the birth of the witty and satirical Kibyoshi in Edo in 1775, uh, Koikawa Harumachi's Kinkin Sensei Ega no Yume. I do not think that Makura Doji contains any direct or specific political criticism, but certainly the bur burlesque depictions of august historical figures, both men and women, have a distinctly rebelliousness that is anar anarchic in its intensity. No notable personage is to be taken seriously. Everyone is nothing more than a sexual animal. No one is safe from being made the butt of jest. One interpretation could be that class or status does not matter and is simply a constructed fiction. We know that the government was sensitive to the burlesquing of historical figures because of the banning of several ukiyozoshi fictional works around 1720, even if they weren't explicitly erotic. There is also a long history of using historical figures in popular kabuki and jōruri theater and Kyoto Osaka ukiyozoshi in Edo gesaku fiction to discuss contemporary topics, including government, governmental affairs. One question to ask is whether there is in fact any serious political or social satire intended or perceived by its original authors and audience. In the context of the other popular literature around it, it is, I think, not possible to read it as politically or socially innocent. I ask the question again, was this work part of a discourse of opposition to the Tokugawa ethical and social system, and therefore promoting an alternative moral, social, or political viewpoint? I won't really talk about it, but in the West, usually we think of the, the scholarship on porn pornography kinds of writing is that it was almost always subversive in one way or another is a generally generally accepted thing uh, today, and especially like around the French Revolution, those kind of periods as well, but more, more broadly. The figures who are made to look sex-craved are all famous and respected icons of the courtier, samurai, and religious worlds. This selection is based on the anthology that it parodies, which presented the ideals of the cultural heritage of the Japanese nation to children. Of course, these weren't official textbooks of the Tokugawa, but they were representing what was perceived as the, uh, I guess you would say, the official lineage of Japanese culture, the cultural heritage. One can imagine that the author and artist had learned from this kind of textbooks as a child and were clearly aware of its significance as representing the official view of Japanese history upon which the Tokugawa system was based. I believe as well that Shuncho had himself had contributed illustration to the 1760 edition of the anthology. Okay. What can we make of this kind of almost anarchic setting up of historical figures in Japanese tradition? It is not easy to gauge the impact of popular culture on social and personal ethics. Let me, rev let me, um, actually too early for that. Let me um, jump a bit, refer to a view of the impact of another genre of popular Edo li period literature on society as viewed by a later scholar, Komiya to Toyotaka, editor of the 14-volume series Meiji Bunkashi, when he sums up what he saw as the role of popular hobby of bunraku chanting, Gidayu, in the general education of the Meiji populace, which was based on reports of scholars in the Meiji period who went around the country surveying what the attitudes of people were and what their lifestyle was like. He says, generally speaking, those born before 1887 usually had barely four years of primary school before setting off to work in society. When faced with the complications of human relations in adolescence and adulthood, they learned their morality and customs not from priest sermons, intellectuals lectures, or government proclamations, but from the words of Gidayu plays or kabuki. The samurai heritage in both Bakufu and Meiji governments, however, were always wary of the impact of popular drama and popular culture. One important source for official Meiji attitudes toward the bunraku's impact on popular morality is the report of the Tokushima Education Committee under the Monbusho guidance published in 1913 under the title of Gidayu Chosasho. The government was so worried about the impact of popular culture. I think it's one of the ways we could gauge how, why the impact was on people of, for, for popular culture. It wasn't just something that passed over them, but it became integral to their view of the world. I mean, I think we can accept that, but it's sort of nice to try to document at least how it was perceived by people in, in times much closer to it. 
The thrust of the report is that Boonrock drama is highly influential in the education of the populace and recommended that certain works, like Love Suicides, be banned due to their negative impact. The committee examined in detail the content of the plays and the repertoire and ranked them according to their suitability in the moral education of the populace. They praised the first rank but found some fault with ranks two and three and say that the pieces in rank four should be abandoned because they are harmful to public morals, though these contain many famous and popular works. The last group, mostly Sevomono, focus on tragic love affairs. It is, in, it is interesting that they propose the editing out of all ref references to the imperial family. This report gives us a sense of the official view of the power of popular discourse. The parody of serious educational textbooks would have been considered far more seditious to the major system. Of course, such books were banned. The concept of Mojidi is fundamental to much popular literature of the Edo period. Let's con first consider the basic meanings found in Japanese dictionaries. Nejiru, yojiru, to twist, to contort, to twirl, various kinds of meanings, wordplay, but also yume na sakuin wo manete kokke ni suru. The last two meanings are relatively close to West, Western word, word for parody. The Japanese often use today the word mojiri in, uh, in, in interchangeably with parody. There is, however, surprisingly little research on mojiri in Edo period literature, considering that it was such a fundamental element of literary production. And rarely does this research ask questions about the significance of the genre, only that it is a, it is a phenomenon in the Edo period. On the other hand, we have considerable work on mitate in nyatsushi, two terms that define different aspects of techniques, most often used in analysis of ukiyo-e prints of relating present society to the classical tradition. Yatsushi has several meanings, the most important given in the Nihon Kokko Daijiten, um, to disguise, dress down, the gentle romantic character who's a lover type, mimesis, imi uh, imitate, imitation, Oops. Uh, fashionably dandy, a flashy woman, dress up, doesn't quite get the meaning that I'm going to talk about here. In the early 18th century, the word yatsushi was used in the Kyogen Os Kyoto Osaka region in ukiyo zoshi fiction in kabuki jorori to describe the technique of taking a classical story as one source text and then turning it into a contemporary setting, often the pleasure quarters, and altering the focus to love affairs, essentially bringing high characters down to earth and often into pov poverty for a period before they are restored to their rightful position. The word seems close to burlesque with its meaning of transformation of something high class into something comic, risque and ridiculous. Hasegawa Tsuyoshi, the doyen of the ukiyo-zoshi genre, has analyzed this technique and usage within ukiyo-zoshi fiction of the word to describe the novels of Saikaku, Nishizawa Ippu and Ijime Kiseki. Hasegawa, however, does not analyze the significance of yatsushi as, pa yatsushi as parody, only considering it to be a popular Edo period technique of relating contemporary stories to classical tales. He does not consider the yatsushi technique to be particularly meaningful, except when the technique comes to dominate as a tour de force and as an end in itself, rather than as a means for a writer like Saikaku to express the essence of contemporary society and culture. He considers this prevalence of yatsushi, yatsushi as simply a convention found in many post-Saikaku ukiyozoshi that is detrimental to the quality of the works as literature. Hasegawa never asked the question, however, what was the significance of the prevalence of yatsushi or mojiri and humor in ikkyozoshi? Is it just an innocent literary technique? Does it help us to make sense of how mojiri or yatsushi works in Japanese from the perspective of parody in the West? Does a comparative perspective help us? Or can it lead us astray? Is research on parody in the West relevant for Japanese scholars themselves? A book published in 1947 by the Edo period specialist Aso Isoji, Warai no Kenkyu, Nihon Bungaku no Shadeisei to Kokke no Hatatsu, a study of humor in Japanese literature, in fact makes use of a study on humor in English literature uh, um, to support his view of humor in Edo period literature as being a fundamental tool of commoners or the less powerful in opposition to the samurai rulers above them. He makes a strong case to view the prevalence of humor in popular Edo period literature as anything but innocent. Rather, he sees it as a weapon towards those in power who restricted the lives of those below them. An article on Mojiri in the Edo period published in 1950 by 
Fuji Kazuzoshi, Kazu Yoshi, is in a similar vein to Aso, but Fuji argues that Mojiri was only a weak tool of a hapless commoners, or low-level samurai against a stultifying samurai government that maintained an artificial and paradoxical social and political structure that allowed for no open dissent. The time of publication of these studies during the Allied occupation of Japan seems to be significant. Both see humor as a tool of the politically weak, and Fuji seems to feel that the frustration of individuals free within society, but paradoxically not in control of the government, the situation of the Japan at the time. This view of humor in popular culture was insignificant politically. That it was insignificant is pervasive in Japan today. In a three-volume collection of essays by various scholars entitled Sei Fuzoku, Sexual Customs, uh, published uh, in the late 50s, Teruoku Yasutaka, in the first chapter, sets up the framework of the Edo period from the legal or official discourse perspective. He argues that the official line was that renai, or love, was not acceptable, and that women were to obey the men around them, father, husband, and son. He then sets up Saigaku as writing in resistance, or he says it, resistance, to this framework as his fundamental philosophy of what the aim of popular literature, particularly koushoku literature, was, erotic literature. These days, it is rare to see a Japanese Edo period scholar refer to any studies outside the Japanese tradition to gain a new perspective on Tokugawa literature. It is also rare for scholars to consider popular literature as, as including political or social commentary. I always get shocked at this, actually. Two exceptions that I know are both women scholars. Uchiyama Mikiko, who analyzed Jodori theater, included that it consistently commented and took a critical view of the contemporary Tokugawa social and political system in Kurakazu Masae on Ukiyozoshi, who has analyzed why certain ukiyozoshi were censored. Older studies of Edo period culture, history, or literature often tried to understand Japanese culture in relation to the West or to China. They tended to focus on the hierarchical status and its inequalities, frequently supported by an underlying Marxist ideological approach. More recent scholarship has usually eschewed this approach, and as a consequence has, like Hasegawa work, ha Hasegawa's work mentioned above, tended to go to the other extreme and see no political or polemical intention in the literature of the period. An obsession with detail among Japanese scholars of the Edo period of the last two generations has made them very knowledgeable of facts, but has also had the consequence of keeping them from asking bigger questions about the significance of what they're exploring. I often feel that lost in the vast amount of material, they are unable to see the forest for the trees. If anything, the trend among younger Japanese scholars is for an ever-increasing obsession with detail. As a consequence, no one has any longer seems to feel the need to ask what is the significance of parody, whether using the term yatsushi or mojiri. Aso's book on Japanese humor was published during the occupation. Age 51 and 47, he had also experienced Japan's military period and its terrible consequences, and, so, and also the strappings of a foreign occupation. He could see, I think, the view of Edo period humor in a different way. Parody in the West is more thoroughly researched, but this genre too has been held in low esteem and to be little of little positive significance in the academy for most of its history. The practice of making fun of something or altering some work to make it humorous has not been appreciated highly in the academy anywhere, although it is one of the most popular forms of human entertainment. Humor is absolutely essential and prevalent in all cultures, but it has never been considered high art and has been a subject that has been spurred as research topic until relatively recently. In general, in the West, parody and satire and burlesque are considered to have subversive intentions. Parody, in the traditional view, most often applied to European 17th, 18th century literature, must have sharp ridicule. Simon Dentith, in his book, Parody, published in 2000, systematically examines the history of research on the subject and argues for a broader historical perspective for a relatively short and, and offers a short, if not simple, definition of parody as parody includes any cultural practice which provides a relatively polemical imitation of another cultural production or practice. The key phrase, of course, is relatively polemical. Dentha states that he's going against the earlier approach of Hutchison, who considered it wrong to define parody by its polemical relationship to the original text. He goes on to explain, in order to capture the evaluative aspect of parody, I conclude the word polemical in the definition. This word is used to allude to the contentious or attacking mode in which parody can be written, though it is relatively polemical because of the ferocity of the attack can vary between different forms of parody. 
Making some element of the polemical an essential part of the definition of parody helps us distinguish it from imitation or illusion. A parody is therefore usually considered to be in an attacking mode to some degree and is consciously calling its attention to itself in relation to the target work. A further distinction that Dentith makes is between parodies that are aimed at a particular work and parodies that take aim in a general area such as a genre, a body of text, or a discourse. This is an important distinction, very useful for understanding the variety of stances the parodies take. Building on the work of Dentith, others have even taken it further, parody saying that it's similar to deconstruction and that uh, people sort of taking it further and further and so you feel like, again, the, you, you can find these deconstructive elements in 18th century Japanese literature, but we won't go into that right here. The pillar book for the young is one of the, I think, masterpieces of the shunpon, these shunga texts, in its scope, text, and images. To many, including many Japanese, however, it is outrageous burlesque and, par burlesque and parody and may appear offensive and embarrassing. It is clear that the underground nature of Shumpon publishing allowed for freedom to satirize whatever was sacrosanct in society. There is, however, no sense of any direct attack on the Tokawa state. At the same time, the humorous and biting tone of the works and the making of highly respected figures into ri ridiculous objects of jest cannot be considered, I think, as I said, innocent fun. The reader is invited into a world where sexual desire is the great leveler that brings the high and mighty to the bestial realm. The object of parody is also, of course, the Orai Mono textbook, the key textbook for transmission of culture. And it's aimed to be orthodox tool of children's education. Osaka and Kyoto publishers produce both the didactic textbooks and the parallel Shunga parodies. This is quite fascinating. And many of the writers and um, artists worked on both as well. This work, I think, fits squarely in the trend of the relatively new genre, Sharibon, with its focus on sex and on satirical writing. The 1770s were an acted, active political and cultural moment with the rise of Tanama to Roju in 1772 and the liberalizing of cultural, political, and social life. Aso Isoji had seen the paradox of the Tokyo system with its artificial facade as the object of political, polemical humor. Perhaps this paradox was most felt acutely in Osaka, a commercial city with a basically egalitarian and self-reliant philosophy which held that advancement should be based on merit and hard work. Jorori and Kabuki both regularly, through codes using past figures, comment and sometimes satirize Tokugawa government from the early 18th century onwards. Fifteen years or so after this Shunchou Sai parody, of all things sacrosanct in Japanese history, Nakai Chikuzan, the head of Osaka's official university in Kaitokudo, would present his ideas on how to reform Japanese government and society directly to Matsurada Sadanobu, who came to Osaka in 1788 because he was carrying out, of course, what was, would become known as the Kansei reforms. One of Chikuzan's fundamental planks for reforms was the abandoning of the samurai class, hereditary stipends. In other words, the abandoning of the class difference. Another was to set up a national education system open to all, both ideas, of course, which would happen in with the first 10 years of the Meiji Restoration. Chikamata Chik Chikuzan's brother, Riken, also wrote a fable about a land where there were no samurai. And another Kaito Kudo scholar, Tominaga Nakamoto, wrote a treatise critical of Confucianism, Shintoism, and Shint Buddhism and Shinto from the perspective that all were historically determined philosophies created by individuals for particular purposes and without absolute truth. Tetsuo Najita has argued that these scholars in Osaka, outside the center of political or courtier life, were highly critical of the Tokawa system and argued not that not only sa samurai had the right to participate in governance. In other words, that it was an artificial system. Of course, Matsurai Sadanobu didn't follow his um, suggestions. The prevalence of coded and direct commentary on the samurai government and its hierarchical and hereditary system in both the popular arts and Kaito Kudo Academy present a case that we should not ignore the political and social criticism in these texts. Naik Nakai Chikuzan's position as the head of a school given an official charter by Yoshimune allowed him to confront directly the Tokawa polity and speak to Sadanobu without fear of reprisal. For the average citizen, however, the access to the quarters of power was impossible and open criticism of the system dangerous. The question we are left with, does this kind of sexually charged attack on the icons of the nation, 
constitute a meaningful counter discourse that had any impact on Japanese society or culture? This is a big question, cannot be answered in isolation, but must be seen in the context of popular literature, theater, art in general, where the stream of anti-Confucian discourse remained constant. Makura Doji's one brilliant work in a long tradition of indirectly commenting or attacking the system. If one could satirize revered historical aristocratic figures such as empresses, Sugawara Michizane, Kukai, Yoshitsune, then nothing that was held up as sacred was safe from ridicule and derision, certainly not the Bakufu government. These underground shumpon offer us a radically different view of the Edo period. It is certainly time to c reconsider the aims and power of parody and humor in the Edo period and to include Shunga books as part of the canon. Thank you. <coughs> yeah.